Come on, we're losing time. I think the first time I saw La Strada, it was uh, dubbed in English. I'm going now. I have been aware of Italian neorealism by watching the films on television when I was five or six, so this must have been when I was about 10 or so. All right, that's enough, hop in. Of course, dubbed in English, uh, it's, it's a, a kind of a mixed bag when it came to La Strada because two of the main stars are American, Anthony Quinn and Richard Basehart. Zoom, zoom. American audience is certainly used to their voices, so it kind of masked the uh, unfortunate, uh, um, the unfortunate sort of desecration of the rest of the film. Because Giorgetta Massina's voice in English, uh, it, it was good. Did you teach Rosa how to play it? But it, it didn't convey the nature of the language, which which was so expressive, funny. Uh, even if you don't understand what they were saying in Italian, it was funny. You could tell it was funny. <laughs> the spirit of Fellini is there, a lot in that language, and a lot in the way people behave towards each other. So it's a credit to the film because whether it was English or Italian, the film still worked very powerfully. Uh, I, I still saw elements of what I was comfortable with as a young boy, which was the neorealism. I kind of understood that. And I remember being vividly struck by the way in which uh, Gesamina and Zampano get together, which is that basically he buys her from the family. And uh, this was, again, something that's uh, post-war in Italy that, uh, as a child, of course, I wasn't aware of that sort of thing. And it was a very strong, powerful point um, that this sort of thing could exist in the world for a child, I'm talking about. And so uh, it was very, very much, <laughs> very much uh, attracted to the film because of the childlike quality, of course, of Gesamina, too. Giulietta Massina's performance, of course, goes way back to the tradition of the ancient theater. She plays a kind of type, almost like a, a stock character that has evolved from the ancient world into the Middle Ages in Italy in the Commedia dell'arte. But the closest comparison you can make to her performance goes from Commedia dell'arte to Charlie Chaplin. And it's quite distinct and quite clear. But we're never quite sure how much she really understands in terms of an adult's mind. Yet she's got the heart. And she is the one point of redemption, Vazampano, who's a brutal man, angry at the world, angry at himself, violence against everyone. So much of the picture takes place in the outside world. It's a, the, uh, the grotesque and the hostile world, still reeling from the war, you know. But what is so lasting about the picture is the humor and the compassion that's found in that grotesque world through Gesamina, even through Zampano. You know, and it's the, the classic Fellini celebrations of life. It's called the road, but on the road they go to the seashore, of course. Their weddings, their carnivals and piazzas. It's a metaphor for <laughs> the film, obviously, the road. It's a metaphor for living, you know, a metaphor for life. Um, in, in the midst of all these celebrations, there's the brutality of Zampano uh, and what he represents, and the inevitability, the inevitability, unfortunately, of the poor fool who, because of his choices, just falls prey to his own fate, creates his own fate. He's going to be killed. He knows he's going to be killed. But he can't stop teasing Zampano, which is very much Fellini. It was very much like a, a comic. You know, Robin Williams would get up and he'll keep going and going and going, and then every now and then something, <laughs> he'll go beyond, and then he'll come back. You know, it reminds me of that, that urge and obsessiveness of really brilliant comic minds. But a brilliant comic mind is really, for me, uh, a mind that uh, looks at life a certain way and understands uh, the absurdity, doesn't take themselves seriously, and that's the fool, you know. But Zampano takes himself seriously. And Zampano is also too hard, too, too world-weary to fall in love, you know. And I think that's ultimately the lesson of the picture, that um, he is redeemed through his emotions for her, Gesamina. And I think that's what happens to Zampano. After he kills a fool, he, he kills something in her spirit, you know. And he, he understands, I think. Maybe I'm reading into it, but he understands what he's done. He understands the gravity, but not only murdering Richard Basar's character, but, but seeing the reaction of her. And I think what was so heartbreaking is how whatever, whatever joy she had in life like a child has been crushed by him, his brutality. Because no matter how bad it was to be bought by this man, to be taken on the road and the way she's brutally rehearsed, despite all that, she was seeing the world. You know, she was seeing the world and she, she's in love with him. Um, that's, a, that's what makes it so touching when he knows that. That's what makes it so disturbing when he knows that. And he knows that there's nothing he could say or do to her, for her, to bring her back, to bring that great spirit back. Spirit of, she's like the spirit of life, you know? And then later on, we have that remarkable ending 
like a primal scream where he just, uh, he knows he had it. You know, he was capable of love. And his violence and his anger stamped it out, you know. But he still, for me, his the, that cry of pain at the end of the film is still, for me, at least a breakthrough for him as a character, uh, a kind of redemption. It's just that cry from that very dark, dark, dark place, the place where you have to do battle with yourself. You know, and I think it's a beautiful, um, beautiful ending. I guess I sensed around me in the world I was living in, people like him, and I think my sort of veering towards or preference for characters who are self-destructive, a lot of it comes from La Strada. In my movies, the American movies, um, a lot of it comes from La Strada, even part of The Fool, too, I think. That aspect of uh, one who just had to say one word too many, you know. And uh, I think there's an element of The Fool and uh, Johnny Boy and Mean Streets, although that's based on people I knew, actually a little bit of an uncle of mine, too, in a way, <laughs> in my family. I don't know, I don't think I've ever spoken about La Strada to Bob De Niro, but there's no doubt that uh, the character Zampano made it very clear in my mind that... Uh, I saw no reason for making not one film, but as many films as possible about a character like that. And of course, Raging Bull is, is I think, the prime example of it. The Zampano uh, in uh, Jake LaMotta. His anger, uh, anger at the world around him, destroying the people around him, and ultimately has to find that redemption uh, through love. I think it relates directly to the Franciscan element in neorealism. The very, very, very essential teachings of uh, St. Francis of Assisi, his religious philosophy, that we find in Rossellini. And we certainly find here, it's in the, it, it, that comes right from that root of uh, the tree of, of neorealism. And it really, because the compassion that he's talking about here, that he's dealing with here in this film, is not just for Jeselmina, we have that. Not just for the fool, we know that, but also for Zampano. You know, for the good and the bad. You feel for him at the end. I mean, why end on him, you see? I mean, in another film, looking at, looking at that another way, that end on her. But it ends on him. That's the tough place to go to, where your heart goes out to him. The other most important thing everybody obviously will notice is the music score by Nino Rota. Nino Rota and Fellini were tied together creatively. One doesn't know if the images created the music or the music created the images at a certain point. It's really as if, um, it really is a, a special world that's created by the sound, Nino Rota's sound that can only exist in, in Fellini films. The moment you hear the first three notes of a, of a Rota score in any of the Fellini films, you think of the word Fellini-esque. Kind of a circus of sound it was in a sense. The Nino Rota music was kind of whimsical and sad and funny and beautiful. Practically every film there is a theme that is recognizable. You know, it's very moving. It uh, pushes the envelope in terms of being sentiment or sentimental. The difference between the sentiment and sentimental, it just goes very carefully around it, you know. I mean, if you don't accept that kind of thing, and you're not going to accept this kind of movie, so, you know, everything you won't accept with it, the music and everything, but, but um, if you do, the music is not cloying, I feel. But it creates a kind of circus of the, the mind, of the soul, in a way. And whenever I hear that Nino Rota music, I always think of the road, them walking down the road in this film, of driving down the road. I think of the road in Kiberia where she meets some two or three kids playing Fife or something. She just travels, just walks along with them. Uh, you think of the road through La Dolce Vida. You think of uh, the circus of Eight and a Half, the circus of making a movie. Uh, it's all scored by Nino Rutte. One, one other key element, this is a good example of the close collaboration between Fellini and his director of photography, Martelli, who had done Vitelloni and Variety Lights. I think it's important because it, it begins a kind of magical, I guess in novels they call it magical realism. This has that, not exactly as in a literary sense, but he could go anywhere visually with his movies. And I get you, it, you, this is indicated in this movie, not in Vitelloni, but in this one. And then in Kiberia, it gets more level, but by the time he's in La Dolce Vita, that it, it's flying into another area, and then finally he lands on, on Mars with eight and a half. You know, that's the end, and it goes on beyond that. The camera work in the film, for me, is, uh, it comes out of neorealism, right? But it's more controlled. The lighting is more sophisticated. He's using actors mixed with non-actors, there's no doubt about it, in the style of neorealism. But what's happening with Fellini is that, of course, he's going off now 
uh, from the, the, the tree of neorealism from Rossellini, Visconti, and De Sica, particularly from Rossellini. Still got that neorealist direction. You'd think you're watching neorealism, but there's a kind of magical sense in the film. Uh, for example, Jessamina, her wonderful uh, ability, like a child, to be excited by everything she's seeing in the world. She runs into that uh, farmhouse uh, while they're having the wedding outside, I think, and there's the, um, the poor uh, disabled child in bed, like something out of a Vermeer painting. The lighting is glowing in, in that scene. I, I, don't, I don't know, it's a very tricky thing because it appears to be one thing, but it's not. It, it, it is very much pre precursing um, um, uh, Dolce Vita in eight and a half in terms of lighting, lighting style. Uh, it's gone into the Fellini magic land, fantasy land, the circus. The circus, that's what it is. He loved the circus. He loved the circus. I, 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 I don't like the circus. I had, I, I had problems with it, but he, <laughs> he really loved the circus and he's the only one I can watch, the only films I can watch the circus scene through his eyes, you know mainly because of the humor, very often the cynical humor, yes, very cynical, but also the compassion. I was lucky enough to meet Fellini in 1970 in Rome, my first trip there, and he was very open, very generous. I brought, as I'm part of a film festival thing, and I brought some uh, avant-garde films uh, to be shown to this festival. And then in the 70s, uh, I went back and forth to Italy and got to know him very, very, very well. And uh, you didn't talk directly about less. With him, you didn't talk directly about, about his movies. Uh, he didn't need to. He uh, was a man who could uh, talk about anything. He was brilliant, whether in Italian or English. So the English was, was a little poor, but the Italian uh, was incredible. Uh, the greatest comic timing, wonderful way of telling stories, whether they were true or not. <laughs> you know, whether he's lying to you or not, I mean, it's quite funny. And the teasing, the constant teasing, like when he said, what did you like about Italy when I first saw him? I said, I like Pompeii. He said, Pompeii's made for the tourists. It never existed. We're just building that, you know. I said, where can I get good lasagna? It's Mama Cesarina's. Now you go there tonight, you get some good lasagna, Mama Cesarina's restaurant. I got there, and I said, Mr. Fellini sent me, he was getting the lasagna. So he came and he ate all of it, they, and his whole party had, there's no more left. So it was, like, <laughs> it was a constant, it was a constant thing like that for the rest of it. And of course I got a little friendly with him because I, I became friends with a lot of people in the Italian film industry. Although you can't be friends with an idol like that. I mean, I can't. You're always more, you're, you're way down, he's up there, so you're always hovering around, you know, and uh, just listening to the stories and uh, uh, descriptions of making the films. But uh, uh, usually he was more interested in telling the stories about the deals and how the things fell apart or how they came together and who robbed who and who's a crook and who's a moral dwarf, as at one point he called a couple of producers. They're moral dwarves, you know, and uh, <laughs> it went on and on like this, you know, uh, some of the funniest things. Um, quite intense, but uh, actually very... I mean, you can just tell from the film, he's a very loving man, a very, very uh, amiable and loving man. We miss him desperately, and um, at least we have some of the films. Even though Evie Toloni influenced me the most directly, this is the cornerstone of all his work, La Strada. I think it's the one you have to see. If you don't see any of his, of his pictures, if you can go from La Strada to eight and a half, it would be okay. <laughs> I mean, it would be wonderful to see Vitaloni and Knights of Cabiria, or even Il Bidone, you know, but if there's only one film I guess you have to see of Fellini's pre eight and a half, I think it would be this one. It's what he's all about. Again, that Franciscan element of neorealism, compassion for every living being. That's the idea. And that's what you have in this film.